Order the Board of Library Committee, Committee of the Whole, the Arlington Heights Memorial Library, uh, today, February 6, 2023. And could we have roll call, please? Sure. Trustee Burrell is currently not here. Trustee Gala? Uh, here. Trustee Metal? Here. Trustee Rule is currently not here. Trustee Samari? Here. Trustee Sublet? Here. President Vic? Here. Okay, and we will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I feel like I want to say the forward test. <laughs> <laughs> all right, do we have any public comment this evening? All right, moving ahead to uh, agenda item five. Mike, do you want to? Anyone? Uh, yes, this is for the purchase of replacement computers for staff and public use. I'd like to ask Rich Dorian, our IT manager, to the table to discuss uh, this purchase. So this purchase is budgeted in 2023 um, for full replacement, and I'll let Rich talk about the replacement and his plans uh, to move forward with it. Sure, thanks, Mike. Uh, so we are looking to replace all of the staff computers, uh, all of the public computers for the uh, computer lab, all of the circulating devices that uh, customers are able to check out and utilize within the library. And then we're also going to be replacing all the catalog stations that are situated around the library for accessing the website and uh, searching all the catalog records uh, for patrons to find things. Um, so we've been we've been utilizing uh, Dell as a vendor for as long as I've been here, 13 years now, and they've done really well by us. And uh, their service and support is great. So you know we're we're looking to continue with that, and that's why we uh, we're you know, hoping to purchase through them. And you know we've, we've we've gone out and looked at other vendors in the past, and Dell's always the, always always the best on price, and they have contracts that are pre bid, and uh, so yeah, we feel really confident in that decision. Any questions, John? So the, the we're replacing 136 computers that are seven years old. 236. 236 that are seven years old. Um, why are we doing it all in once instead of phasing it in? And by doing it all in once, aren't we putting ourselves in the same position seven years from now? Oh, I would speak oh, to the reasoning sure. there. Sure. Uh, so with every one of our computer refresh cycles, that's when we launch all of our uh, Windows upgrades. Mm. Uh, so right now we're going to move to Windows 11 as part of the upgrade process. Uh, and this allows all of our staff to go through training and then for us to be on the same software platform for the staff computers as well as the public computer computers so that all of our training programs are aligned with the new version of Windows. All the software is compatible with all the, you know, any changes that are, you know, um, you know, system requirements and whatnot mm -hmm. for, for the hardware. Uh, so we just like to, we, we do it in phases throughout the year. So we do the staff in the, in the spring and then we do the, the public usually in the fall, um, but not across fiscal years usually normally. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious. So if this was done seven years ago, do we need the exact same number of staff and public computers? Have you found that those are the um, exact numbers that we need? Or? We did go a little bit lighter on the public computer side. Uh, there was a few reductions in the computer lab area um, just because they've had um, they've, they've had them spaced out for, um, you know, ever since COVID. Mm -hmm. And they just, I guess they, they said due to the numbers, they said they kind of just want to keep a little bit more space. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of where they've been filling. And then we decided we could, you know, at a later date, if the, if the numbers pick back up to pre-COVID numbers, we could just add more stations at that, that point. Um, and then I do believe we maybe removed two or three public stations around the library. I think we took down a couple that I'm not uh, planning to replace, but okay. but for the most part, I think we're maybe 15 total less than mm -hmm. what we that originally makes sense. had. Yeah. I would suspect a lot of people do you know their requests at home and then just come here to pick up the materials. Right. Perhaps exactly. more than seven years ago. And we and as part of this, we did actually increase the number of available circulating devices. We actually are pretty much always booked up every day mm. for the number of devices utilized within the library. 
Um, we'd like to check them out for you know, either going to a quiet study area or for you know working as part of a school assignment or for a group if they just don't have their own device. Um, so we uh, we did increase those. What is the time limit that someone can take one out for the day? Is there? Um, I believe they check them out based on the number of people that actually have a request in for them. Yeah. So yeah, if no one else is requesting them, you can pretty much Got just it. keep renewing it for the for the duration of the day. But if there's a waiting list, then they would probably, I believe it's two hours, but it could be four in some of them. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, we have a quick oh, one. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. Hey, um, I'm off of mute, right? Okay, good. Hey, uh, first of all, Rich, thank you for uh, your estimated being $140 underneath the budgeted. So I always, I always like that. So, so, uh, so thank you for that. But um, out of curiosity, does this number just, is just the cost of the hardware or does it include like any kind of service package or replacement parts or anything like that? Yes, it does. Uh, great question. We have five years of on-site service and support for all of these devices. And then we also um, tack in about um, five to seven like spare devices that we have. So we can kind of hot swap, hot swap them in. You know, if something goes down, we can just roll out another one and then fix the broken one um, when we're when we have time. Uh, and that's pretty much the model we've been following. And so the the available spare computers typically get us through any sort of uh, uh, stop gaps between the five and the seven year mark, uh, you know, when our service plan runs up before the end of the replacement cycle. Okay, good. And then the, the 236 that we're disposing of, are they going to be recycled or what what happens with all of them? Uh, I don't believe we plan on just recycling them. Last time we actually, uh, they ended up at the Friends and they uh, went to the Friends sale and we had, a, I believe, a really successful uh Turn out of customers uh, that wanted to purchase them, and I think we sold almost all of them pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Safe for I don't remember the price on them, but they were yeah, you know, they were they were a good amount, I and mean, people really liked them. Okay, good. So so we're not just putting into an adult into a dumpster somewhere. Oh no, that's not the plan. <laughs> okay, all right, great, thank you. Anything else? That was uh, done before a vote in two weeks. Right. Thanks, Rich. Thank you, Rich. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Uh, next agenda item on the 2023 Illinois Public Library annual report, more commonly known as IPLAR. Okay, so uh, what you have before you is the completed IPLAR uh, report for 2022. Uh, so this is a report of last year's numbers. In the memo, I did highlight a few numbers that uh, you might want to take note of or you might have had questions on. Uh, first is the total number of study rooms used by the public during the fiscal year. So we saw a large increase between 2021 and 2022, going from 3,762 in 2021 to 11,960 in 2022. So clearly, um, you know, more people are using those study rooms coming out of COVID. We have more people coming back to the library. Uh, you know, as we've seen um, in our statistics over the past six, eight, 12 months, um, you know, we've looked, we've been able to, to see that people are coming back to the library for other things besides books and, and programs, so. Did, I'm curious, did you look at 2019 and compare 22 to 2019? Uh, you know what, I didn't um, no, have those numbers. Curious, and yeah, yeah, it's probably- that, That's a better so, measurement, right, yeah. Right. Uh, then in other income, the local government, um, this is the essentially our property taxes. So if you look at 2020 and 21, we're hovering right around $14.2 million in 2022. We're at $11.5 million, and that was because of the Cook County delay in the second um, installment of uh, taxes. Then the next one, capital revenue, other capital re revenue uh, in 2021, 2,873, and then in 2022, 43,937. This one does fluctuate from year to year. This is interest income on our investments. So uh, 2021 was very low. Obviously, you see, we saw a major increase in that in 2022. Then on the next page, uh, the librarians, a librarians. Uh, this is a change in the reporting of how we reported it in 2021. So if you look at 2020, we had 20.74 uh, FTEs of librarians. 2021, we grouped um, all positions. And if the uh, current staff member had 
an MLS degree. And after further review of the instructions on the IPLA report, we decided that that was not what they were looking for. So we went back to the uh, way we were doing it in 2020. So we were at 18.99 uh, FTEs of positions that required MLS. So we have MLS uh, librarians in positions that aren't necessarily required. Correct. That's why it was, you just included all of them in 21. Right. Got right. It. And so for instance, Rich, who was just here, right. our IT manager has an MLS, but his position isn't required. Just as an aside, um, if, um, the, the staff that have MLS that are not in MLS positions, is it because they earned their degree here? While they're working here, some or do we you you hire MLS for? Uh, Sometimes we do. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. I have done a no no of that in my library. Yeah, it's, if uh, a position doesn't require an MLS, you yeah, don't hire doesn't it require no, it, 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 and, and we hire we won't hire. Really? That's my mandate. Yeah. Well, because I feel it's it's a detriment to our profession. That's just yeah. my personal That's feeling, true. and uh, um, and in fact. We had a part-time children's librarian position, was paraprofessional, and um, they found someone who was excellent. She was a librarian from St. Charles and library, and she quit, and I, I said, no. And I said, but go back and take a look at the job. What are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And if you can beef up the job description and you can make it an MLS, I give my approval. And so that's what we did. And now the person's become full time. But anyway, I just, that's just my, my side. I yeah, feel no, it's a good point. Is the, uh, to make the, you know, profession pure. But I, I this is good. I, I'm glad. Um, I mean, because it really should be the librarians doing the librarian work yeah. for, for FLR. Yeah. yeah. So those were the kind of the major standouts uh, in the statistics. Uh, but I'd be happy to try and answer anything that you guys have uh, regarding. This report. Mike, I had a question. When you, there were several areas where there was a bold number and then a non bold. Is the non bold the new number and the That's bold correct. was last yeah. year? That's yeah. what I figured. Yeah, it's but kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. You would think the bold. I just want to make sure that I got that right. Okay. okay, so the bold is old, last year. Okay. Right. It's a previous submission. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question. One second. Let me find where it was. Um, okay, under the age of facility, where is that? I guess I was confused because they're there are like the four, there's the bookmobile, the, the main library, the senior center, and then the maker place. Um, and under the age of facility, there were three things. So I was just confused about like, one was like under five years, one was like 40 to 51, and one was us. Uh, oh, sorry. Eight, eight. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah, so there's one that's five years or less. I'm assuming that's the Pokemobile. Mm. I, I guess I was confused because there were only three when there were like four listed in the other places. I don't think the Pokemobile would be included in that. Oh, okay. Okay. That's not a facility. Good you know what? We'll We'll look into that and uh, clarify it. Okay. I was very impressed at how many library cards um, we have 58,874, and there's what, 76,000 yeah. people in town? That's awesome. Yeah. How, how often do we purge? I want to say every three years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just purging is just, okay, I'm sorry. Purging is because they have not used the card. Right. In how long? Or they're expired. Oh. Um, I don't know. Dana, would you know that off the top of your head? Three years. I think it's three, but I will check for next time. 
Just and out of curiosity, sorry. If, if you have them, um, they have materials on their card. You do not. In other words, they haven't returned them. You probably keep it in the system for likely, but sometime oh, I will talk to you about that. Okay. <laughs> We'll, find, we'll um, bring back what the criteria is for purging cards. Where's my hand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just out of curiosity, roughly how old is the bookmobile? Like, it is, I want to say, about 10 years old. Okay. Um, yeah, so that is something on our long range plan that um, we are looking to replace probably in the next couple of days. Um, just one last question. So I was just curious about the minimum hourly rate actually paid. And I recognize that um, these are part-time staff and po possibly um, high school students, but $12.98, is that our starting salary? No, that would be probably the lowest um, of the grade. For 2022, the lowest of the lowest grades for 2022, probably not starting salary though, because we typically start people a little bit off that. So a little lower than that. A little higher than that. Oh, okay. Yeah. The so, minimum wage was twelve dollars last year. Right. Yeah. I just. So what I know that Arlington Heights opted out, but have we ever thought about when Cook County went to fifteen dollars an hour or is going to fifteen dollars an hour? We're pacing that. Okay. As well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are 2022 numbers. Okay. So 2023, we've increased it and then we'll increase it in 2024. I think it's 25 where we have to be at 15. Got it. Or, so are we at 13 then? I don't remember what the, the minimum is, but where you are at, whatever the, the new minimum is, we're above that. Anything else? Someone had sent me this article, so I did when you said book won't be right because it, it it it's talking about the demise of bookmobiles, you know, in the country. And I guess Warren Newport is now talking about getting rid of their bookmobile. Okay. Well, it, they declined from eleven hundred twenty-five nationwide in ninety-one to fewer than six hundred and fifty in twenty nineteen. Mm -hmm. And we got into the game late at Gilboard uh twenty. 2019, I think we started. There's a book, little bit of bookmobile service back in the 60s, but it was a cooperative thing. It didn't last very long. Oh my gosh, there's no way we could get rid of this. Right. Yeah. No way. Right. You know, and, and uh, I don't know. I think communities are a little bit short sighted in, in doing this. I don't think they um, really have a strategic plan for it, shall we say? And because there are a lot of barriers getting to a physical building. <laughs> Yeah, actually, you know, children especially, you know, they can't drive. Yeah. You know. And looking at the strategic plan feedback, you know, the initial feedback, people love the point. Yeah, there's just no way we could I know. possibly get rid of that. Yeah. Uh, really good bang for our buck there. So I know that when I used to work in geriatrics, and it was not in this community, there was a bookmobile that came to our senior living center, and it was huge. Yeah, because yeah. even for like some of my patients that at the time mm -hmm. could not physically even go to the bookmobile, I was able to get a list of things that they might be interested in or a genre, and I could go as a staff member and worked with that particular, you know, township or whatever and utilize their their books uh, or their uh, cards rather and check out books in there for them so that you know, the residents had mm -hmm. access, which, you know, a lot of them don't have families or whatever that can do that. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge boost to even the senior living community as well um, that that have care. Um, and there still wasn't somebody who could go to the library and give them a book. We had a woman <clears throat> who first started the route and she, she said, this is the first time I've been to the library. I can't drive. And the library is too far for her to walk to or there's no public transportation that's convenient. So it was very special to her. Here she finally could see a collection of materials and, and select them herself. Yeah. Well, I think in a town like ours that's long, I mean, it's easy if you live in the center of town, but if you're at either end and 
to your point, people, mm -hmm. kids that don't drive, I, I am very impressed by the number of um, uh, items from the collection taken out from the bookmobile. Yeah. I mean, that's great. People aren't just like checking it out. They're actually using it and taking out materials. Yeah. It is uh, it is a beloved service of ours, uh, and it's our 50th anniversary of the bookmobile too. I mentioned really? that. Being around. Yeah, yeah. So started in 1973. Wow. Uh, Andy, just to step back to your question about the minimum wage, I uh, looked up real quick. The Cook County minimum wage, 1330 uh, per hour. Our new one for 2023 is 13.59, so just above minimum for our. That's our. That's what the library is doing grade um the lowest amount for that but we typically do higher off of higher than that okay any other questions yeah. on that is it just no. right is, is this uh approved at the board meeting it'll be approved the board okay. meeting, so we'll bring it back yeah that will be a quick pass through yeah okay now next thing consideration of flag and according to policy use of flags on library property. So uh, John had submitted a proposal. John, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, so this is um, following up on the procedure that we established last year and uh, making sure that I hit all the boxes and checked all the uh, boxes correctly. Um, this would be a good time to review the, the content of the request to make sure that it meets the the requirements of the, the process. So what you have in your pa packet is the form that John submitted, and then the attachments for um, that were included in that form, the presidential proclamation, uh, Pride Month, uh, which has links to those presidential proclamations. And uh, from what I understand, these links may not have been live. Did anybody have a problem opening them? Okay, I heard from at least one person that they may have been difficult to open. Uh, before the next meeting, I'll send those uh, just in an email so you have live links. Uh, and then the next page is an image of the flag that would be flown. And this will be the same flag that was flown last year. And then we also included the policy um, as approved. So Greg has a question. Greg? Go ahead, Greg. Hello there. Um, yeah, John, thank you very much. Uh, you've been the guinea pig a couple of times in, uh, in, in, in doing this. So, so thank you very much. You know, the one thing that I'm thinking, and, and you guys can shout me down on this one, is, you know, some of the links that you sent in the Word doc, uh, that's the type of evidence that we're looking for. They are for proclamations, though, for 2022. So my right. thought is that when we go to do the official um, the vote on this, uh, which I guess is going to be this month, we should probably say something uh, into the effect of based on the federal government or the state issuing uh, proclamations for 2023. Yeah, I'm fine with that. The reality of the proclamations is that they're not done until the week of or even the day of right. Heritage Month. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that the, the real the realistically that is anticipated, but it should be it should be spelled out. That's okay. something that we need. Sorry. No, no, no. I'm done. Uh, is that something that we need to consider in regards to our policy? If in fact, um, you know, one of the the things is for us for it to be a. I'm looking for the verbiage as I'm talking, which is never good to try to talk and read at the same time, but. Um, where is it? Um, I know that we, we had that it was a recognized cause through the state of the proclamation. And if we're going to tie this to the year and that the proclamations may not come out until, you know, the 1st of June in this case, do we really want our policy to be tied to that or, or can it be retroact you know it was a proclamation from the year prior or that we know it like i just is that no, i i wouldn't try to you know the re, the reality of the once they're never going to rescind a proclamation can you imagine right yeah so i guess that was my question like the, i just don't want to i don't well, there's yeah, been an after, 
Yeah. We didn't want to like, yeah. well, it hasn't happened yet. Therefore, you can't. And we've said we have to have it 60 yeah. days in advance. And therefore, now we can't ever do it because we just put ourselves into. Well, no, I, think, yeah, I, think, I think it's fine. Yeah. It's I, I think we're just kind of covering ourselves by putting some type of verbiage in the, in the motion that, you know, saying based yeah. on it. Because, because the, the federal government won uh, the, 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 um, the date on that one for last year was the beginning of May. So that definitely, you know, it's not within the time frame. But if we do this before that, and we say at by that time, you know, that's when we can do this. As long as as long as we have the proclamation before June first, and uh, this or on any or on any on, on any flag that we may decide to do. Yeah. Hey, um, respectfully, I disagree with uh, President Zick in just that we created a policy, and our task is to determine whether this meets the standards and in our policy it does not say anything about the year of proclamation so um i am not suggesting we go back and revisit the policy and add in the year but as it stands it does not include it and that would be get a whole nother like an addition to the policy and then our job right now as i understand it is to you know take the the criteria that we've been given and apply it to the policy and make sure that that is a limit test so well, the reason why, and I'm not saying not to go ahead and do it, but just base it on, on that it's going to be done. Because the reason why we put these things in here to be very straightforward was to make sure that we are legally protected uh, in case anybody in case anybody comes up and, 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 and questions why we're doing it, which we know we do get questions. Um, so we can state that we're doing this according to our policy, that there is a proclamation. Because right now, if there is, if we go ahead and we just approve it without that verbiage in it, and that's all I'm saying is let, let's add in that verbiage. If we do it without that verbiage and somebody comes back and says, well, according to your policy, there has to be a proclamation, but there hasn't been one for 2023. It's not going to happen. Like Carol said, it's, there, there is going to be a proclamation. But just so we have all the right verbiage in there, we dot our I's and we cross our T's. Um, but I would say we didn't have a year in the original policy. So why would we add a year now? I think there's two things. I think one, this is a this is still an evolving thing because we we did something that we we didn't do before. But at the same time, you know, it says whether it says whether the United States, here's the verbiage with the words we have, whether the United States or the state of Illinois has recognized the flag or caused through statute or proclamation or other official communication. If we go ahead right now and we say that we're going to we're, we're going to put the flag up based on proclamation, we haven't done it. Because somebody can come back to us and say, well, wait a second. No, if the proclamation never comes out. Somebody's going to come back and say, well, no, there isn't one because that proclamation was only for 2022. We didn't have a proclamation for 2023. And I guess I would say, I don't know that the president of the United States makes a proclamation every year that today is flag day. It was proclaimed that in whatever year flag day was started and it's flag day. So I think that might be making things more difficult than they need to be. I mean, I obviously it's very important that it meets our criteria of being, having been proclaimed that. Um, at one time. At one time. But I, you know, what if the, I don't know, what if the government like has a snowstorm and doesn't get it out that day or something. I don't know. I, we're not tied to a date, and I don't think we should change to be tied to a date now. I think it puts us in. I'm, I, no, I didn't ask for permission. I, I'm agreeing with you. I think it puts us in a situation where, if for whatever reason it isn't done in the same way because a different person is in charge and the proclamation doesn't come out in the same way. I do fully support that we need to follow our guidelines, but I I don't know that we need to go back and change it. Um, just again, if, if we tie ourselves to a specific dated proclamation, 
it puts us in a situation that we have to wait until June 1st for the proclamation to be coming out. And our policy states that it has to be 60 days prior. I believe that that's correct. Um, you know, for staff to have time to ascertain the flag and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, it basically makes this null and void. It's a useless policy if we tie ourselves to a date like that. Um, I'm not at all saying that it shouldn't be um, approved by, you know, I, I'm like, I'm just, where did my verbiage go? Um, recognized um, uh, flag or cause the statute proclamation or other com official communication. But, like, to your point, flag day is flag day. And I can go to most any calendar and find out what day flag day is going to be. And I don't know that we look for a proclamation to know that it's flag day. Um, and my concern would be that if we did say it had to be a proclamation for 2023, 2024, or whatever, if that does not come out until that date, it puts us in a tailspin that we wouldn't be able to meet those needs. Yeah, yeah I, I can see both sides of the discussion. I really can. Um, I think my concern is we've got a policy in place. We need to, we need to, we, let's give it a chance to work. Yeah. Well, let's take this policy, give it a chance to work, see where it takes us, see if in fact, um, there is a policy that's a proclamation every year. I mean, the, the administration could perceive it as they've, they've set their proclamation and it's reinforced by the Department of State and the USDA and others. There's no reason to have an annual proclamation during the administration, but um, let's, we've got a policy in place. Let's, let's stick to it and, and uh, see how it works. And, and, and I, I get everything. I guess the only thing I would just probably say is think, think, uh, think through this. If there is no proclamation that's ever made and somebody wants to challenge that back in June or sometime after that legally, do we have the grounds to, to, uh, to, to, to fight that? Yes, we do, because we have a proclamation dated May 31st, 2022. And we're following that policy. It may not be ideal, but it is. Right. It meets and, the standard of the policy. And, and the sentence above it, when approving flag reform in the library cycle, the board will consider the following. And you've got another weather. It doesn't say all of the above, all of the above, you know, whether what you just talked about whether the flag represents a national, state, or local interest. So it doesn't necessarily need a proclamation if you go to, because it doesn't say, and, you know, number one, and, number two, and, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's all of these. Whether the flag represents positive interest or a value worthy of public recognition. So, um, you know, it's, it's what the board will consider in approving, approving this. So, um, sometimes it, it's better to leave things a little more general than to get so specific. Uh, that can get you in trouble too, Greg, if you're too specific. <laughs> That's what attorneys will tell you. <laughs> Anything more on this tonight? Yes, Amy. I just wanted to ask um, Mike if you know, or Dana or Mary, of some of the programming i'm assuming that we're doing programming because we always do mm -hmm. so we are i just want to confirm we are doing programming around pride month yes okay. yes we do oh, yeah. um i don't know the specifics dana do you know any of those specifics off the top of your head or mary coming through the newsletter do you mention your i don't team? think we'll have those for another couple months from programs team i'll just echo that i don't know specifics yet but you guys should mention on Saturday that you have a team that's dedicated to Heritage Months right. for program. Right, right. So they'll be working. Well, we have our programs team, right. and then we have the committee that uh, creates consistency throughout the library. So our displays, our book discussions, our you know website presence, um, all that stuff is consistent with our, what we're programming. Um, so one may not, one may drive the other. Programming might drive some of the other things, but. Um, the programming decisions are still mostly in programs. Could I ask that um, maybe at the May meeting or April, if you have it, um, once the programming is set, that you'd let us know ahead of time in case we get questions in the community? I mean, that's something that could come up like 
I know you're having the pride flag. If we decide that tonight, what are some of the programs surrounding that? When they're, you know, not rushing them, but clearly they'll know before they print, you know. Sure. Yeah, we can send that. I'll okay. send that to you. Thank you. Good job. One final comment, and this is kind of an observation of the whole experience, is that and from the research I've done on National Heritage Month, there's only one month that actually has a flag, only one. So as you move forward and consider these things, really what you're considering are resolutions for other opportunities, whether it's Juneteenth or um, uh, Native American, Alaska Native, uh, uh, Native Americans. Um, those would just be, would be um, resolutions, not not flags, because from what I've seen, there aren't any. You mean not not um, proclamations? There are no, flags. they're proclamations. There's, no, there's not flags. Oh, there's, 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 there's not official. Flags. No, they're not official they're flags. Not official, no. I and you may have one. There's not for one heritage. There could be five flags right. for. So which one do you fly? I know Hispanic Heritage Month is that. Right. One. Yeah. Well, it, it, Juneteenth isn't a heritage day, but I did I did some research on Juneteenth and I found a Juneteenth flag. There's there's, there's flags for everything, but they're not recognized by the state of Illinois or the federal government as the standard for that National Heritage Day or National Heritage Month. And that's what we ran yeah. into with um, Native right. Alaska Natives and American Natives. Mm -hmm. If, if I if I could though to 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 that though if we take the previous discussion you know like point two whether the flag represents a national state or local interest is consistent with the library's mission vi vision values or official sentiments that leaves it very open so we could potentially if if, if we're taking out that it doesn't have to be a an official proclamation for that point for that time period we don't need to worry about that anymore because we can just we can we, we can just decide on a flag and, and, and vote on it as long as we find that it hits points two and or three we're not taking out the proclamation like to carol's point a moment ago these are things the board will consider right so we're not taking anything out no no, no i'm not saying we're taking anything out but i'm saying because we decided that it wasn't an and for those that we're saying it's an or so if it's an or, we we can just take that out and not even worry about considering it, and we can just consider the other two. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? Thank you. Okay, moving on to Maker Place data and statistical reporting. Okay, so uh, we had a discussion about statistics a couple months ago, uh, probably about a month ago, uh, and talked about the new dashboard that would, we would um, begin using for the main library. Um, during that discussion, the board requested a um, separate statistic, statistical dashboard for the maker place. So you could see in kind of in a little bit more detail as to what's happening over there. And so uh, what you have before you is a um, draft of the uh, potential dashboard for the maker place statistics. So this is representative of January of this year. Um, so just kind of running through it here um, at the top, we have the total visits to the space in that month. Um, the next spot is new users. And so new users is the number of waivers that are signed in that month. So we can tell, you know, people that come in and engage in the space uh, that have not been there before um, through the sign up of the waivers. So of those 1,062 users in January, 108 of those were uh, new users, while the uh, difference there uh, were returning users. Uh, the next is just kind of a, a wide spectrum of total visits uh, in a graph, kind of giving you an idea of trends there. We then break out the equipment usage based on um, the space. So we have the fabrication room with small tools uh, um, usage, sewing room, uh, technology usage, and the art space. Um, so that's based on the internal loans of that equipment. So people check out um, the laser cutter or you know so, uh, vinyl cutter or you know utilize a sewing machine. Um, all of that is counted there. That gives you a little bit of an idea of how people are using the space uh, as far as using the equipment. Uh, then the program attendance is broken out by the different areas as well. So we have the kitchen program attendance, 
uh, maker is the fabrication room, and then any you know any programs that might take place in the sewing space or the art space, stuff like that. Uh, we also are still offering the tours, so we uh, wanted to break those out separate. And then other, um, don't exactly remember what other uh, contained, but it was just other um, visits to the space that didn't fit in within one of those categories. Maybe like Scott. Yeah, right, right. Uh, then next we had the 3D print jobs. So those are um, 3D prints that are submitted via the website. And... Uh, and then printed, or they could be submitted internally as well. And then e-learning, uh, the 412, that is for the uh, internal learning um, or training for those each of those pieces of equipment that we've created for our customers, where our customers can go and learn the basics of one of those pieces of equipment through uh, Niche Academy. And um, so that is kind of like a first um, exposure to the equipment or the basic learning uh, of that equipment through those um, through that e-learning. So we figured that might be a good one for you guys to see as well. So is that e-learning at my house that I'm watching a YouTube tutorial and then? You can. Or, okay, so they don't, have, so e-learning, they can do it at their home right. or, or here the or right. there. Right, but it's specific to our equipment. Got it. We've yeah. created the, the yeah. uh, training. Any questions? Yeah, John. Um, an observation. So. Again, I'm reflect I was I was reflecting on your presentation on Saturday, which was excellent. And you know, the success and, and and the strategy that you're going into for the maker place combined with the, the larger strategic plan. And you look at the huge success of the culinary experience, which not is that's not just because of the space, but it's also because of the instructors and the courses that you have that draw people in. Do you have similar uh, a similar model for small tools and sewing, for example, like uh, how how to how to sew a dress and, and have somebody come in and instruct young people over a course of you know three or four sessions they can sew something or they can make a diorama or something. We do have similar programs for each of those spaces um, where they go in and make a product or something like that. I think we had a pencil case was one and a couple other other ones, um, and even with the 3D printing and stuff like that, we do have similar things. They just don't have the um, the demand that the culinary stuff mm -hmm. does. Um, the maker stuff seems to be a slower progression of people coming in to explore and see what it's about, yeah. understand how it fits in their life, and learns you know learning the equipment. If the culinary stuff, I think. Everybody is just interested in getting in there and cooking something. Yeah, but, and, I, and I reflect on Andy's uh, experience of the embroidering, and I would have to think that there would be a lot of opportunity um, for us to train people in mass. You only got two employers. Maybe that's not the best example, but sewing or something, mm -hmm. um, or some of these, uh, or, or the um, 3D printer or something yeah. like that. Yeah, we do similar programs yeah. like that. Dana, do you have any specific examples that you want to share? We have the inter like all the basics classes, um, but without like looking it up in front of me. No, we do. We are, but they're. I think in um, Andy said they're very labor intensive, and it's more like is it less appeal? I guess is cooking. So yeah, but there's sewing machine classes. There's add add quilters. There's sewing bees that meet there at the maker place. So people are using it and enjoying the space. I just don't think it has the. Um, attention grabbing headlines as a lot of the kitchen culinary events. Um, but we are, I can get some more specifics for you for next time. But honestly, we've been looking at our staffing models, looking at how volunteers can support or volunteers and um, other staff can support the expert makers so we can make it more available um, and less intimidating for customers to come on off the street and do open making. Um, but it is labor intensive, as we mentioned before, and it does take a while to, to get that audience. Yeah, don't go into any extra work of pulling together data or anything like that. I just know that when I come out of the kitchen, I got a Cinnabon, right? <laughs> right. Now, if I come out of, out of some, one of these other experiences and I have something tangible that is meaning to me, yeah. like a Cinnabon, yeah. then I'm more likely to participate in that experience. Yeah, totally yeah. makes sense. Yeah. All right, thank you. Hey, well, I did. Oh, I'm sorry, John. Oh, yeah. um, I had a couple other questions. Um, for the top of the dashboard with the new users, 
Yeah. Um, so I, I get what the maker place in the kitchen, what, what is the maker place and kitchen? Is that like someone came in and did both? Yes. Uh, so we have a waiver for the maker place and then we have a waiver for the kitchen. Um, so then we have a condo waiver. waiver for okay. Example. So, okay. Yeah, so this is all. a waiver base. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is the visit also waiver based or is that like, no, that is just a door count. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Cause I know I've, I've come in just to like use the space before and have used equipment, but yeah. how right. we count it as a visit. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm going to find my next question. <laughs> uh, my, my one question was about the tours. Are those tours that like are set up ahead of time and people are coming in or is it, are these people just stopping by and, you know, Joe happens to be there and walks them around? These are pre-scheduled tours that people can register for. And then otherwise they would just be considered, that wouldn't be considered a program. It would just be considered a visit. Well, if it's an impromptu tour, like a group came in and they wanted a tour, we probably still count that as a tour. Um, but a majority of them are the pre-scheduled tours that people can sign up for. Because, you know, when I was there, like, I would say at least three or four times, people just kind of wandered in. They had not seemingly set up a tour or anything. And they just were like, what is this? Where? What can I do here? I've heard about it. I'm just here to figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a staff member maybe took them around or maybe didn't. I just was trying to figure out where that falls in this uh, schematic. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are pre-scheduled tours. But if, um, you know, if the staff are available to give them a, a you know, tour of the space, they'll do that as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I found my questions. Um, so I think one thing that might be helpful for me is like a little appendix of like what falls under fabrication, like just some examples. It doesn't need to be everything. Because when I see small tools, like is that like the laminator? Is that the vinyl cutter? Like are those like things that aren't like kind of stuck in place that you can move? Um, and then also with the computers, because again, there have been a couple of times where I've come in and like use the computer and then I don't have time to do the actual fabrications. So we'll come back later. Does that fall under like technology? Yeah, technology. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I'm also just curious, doesn't necessarily need to be part of this, but I know Andy and I had both mentioned like, wouldn't it be nice if it was open on Fridays? Um, so I'm just curious, like I'm guessing weekends are the busiest days. Are there other days or times that are you know, busier now that we've been open for. I know weekends are, are pretty busy. Dana, do you want to speak to this? They're, they're we're currently um, evaluating the hours. And okay. Well, I do want to step back and say, make our place. Do not worry about these numbers. They, we are outperforming any of our peers in this category. And I know Mike likes to hear that, but um, we're taking a lot of data and this is really doing well comparatively, but um, any, it really varies, but every day we're open seems to get busier and busier, particularly like after you know, in the afternoons. Um, and that's why we're really looking at our staffing levels. Um, we've had some turnover, we're getting our, you know, now we're like quote unquote fully staffed, but it's still not enough to keep up with the demand. So really to open it more days, we'd really have to get our staffing model um, set. And again, we're, we're trying to look at ways that we can do that, but it's really to free up the time for the experts to be available. So they're not just coming in um, and cause you need that guidance, especially while we're still, um, trying to gain the audience. Um, it's, it's, but it has been looked at and we're also looking at how to fit rentals into this model too, because that's also, I know, um, important to us going forward. And we're trying to get that balance of the rental, the space while we're in there. Cause there's just a lot of protocols that need to happen in terms of the waivers, the staffing, um, you know, all the, all the safety protocols in terms of kitchen, et cetera. So there's just a lot of factors to consider, but we have been meeting regularly too. Um, to discuss all those things, but really, um, again, it's, there's, <laughs> we're doing great, but it, it is going to be a little bit more, a couple months before we have it, um, to put more classes into place. Um, so we can make those numbers look a little bit better than they are, but I think we're all over doing great. Okay. Um, no, this is great. Thank you. And to Dana's point, actually, I was just curious because our, our Girl Scout troop has come in and just curious on rentals. And I don't even know if that would be considered a rental. I mean, they come in they, as a group, right? Yeah. So, so I guess, and again, not to put this on there or anything, I'm just more interested in 
like, are we getting groups to come in and how are they using it? Um, are they renting it? And, and just, just an overall, I, I don't think it's need to be on there. Just curious. Yeah. yeah, I think we've only had one formal rental from an outside okay. business that came in and they rented the kitchen and the uh, makerspace uh, for like a, um, you know, like a work staff day. Um, so that one uh, went really well. Um, we're not pushing it too much, as Dana mentioned, you know, we're still trying to figure out some of the staffing to accommodate the programming for, um, so that is uh, definitely a very good point. But no, when a large group comes in, that's just considered business. So you, you think about it as a team building experience, that would be yeah. tremendous. You sell that to the Chamber of Commerce and have some of the small businesses bring their people in there. Right. You can all make mugs for themselves. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so then make a place and posters like I don't know a Girl Scout troop when it's cookie selling time or I my kids all did science fair we had to do the big poster things and I just think there's so much great equipment there but that takes time before the teachers in those grades and the students in those grades know about it and feel comfortable and I but just want to say Oh, that anytime you're open to that, we do just all, if anyone, if you're hearing that on the streets, like as an ambassador, just have everyone contact the website, the makerspace staff, and they'll happily set up an activity for the group, a brief tour, whatever is needed, but we're not calling that a rental. Yes. Okay. Last question. Um, this isn't necessarily related to the dashboard. Again, this is more just curiosity. Um, I'm curious about maintenance. Have you had like issues with maintenance since this is like different equipment and like... um not no, we haven't had major uh, any major issue. Are you talking about the building infrastructure or the no, like equipment, the equipment itself? itself? Um no, well, luckily we've had we have a dozen 3D printers. Mm -hmm. So if a 3D printer needs um assistance, you know, or need to be pulled out for maintenance, you know, we have enough there to buffer that. Um the laser. Cutters, we've had a couple minor things. When we first opened, we had a board go bad in one of the printers, but are the cutters and the, the manufacturer overnighted a, um, a board to us. Oh. We have had some issues with the CNC machine, um, but nothing significant. Um, I know we pulled it out around the holidays just because it was somewhat, um, it wasn't super reliable for them. And other libraries have pulled their CNC machines out as well, uh, just because it, it takes kind of a higher level of expertise to right. use it, but it, I don't know that it was um, a failure of the equipment. Uh, besides that, I think everything has been pretty stable. Uh, not Dana, do you know different? Well, the staff, no, I don't know the specifics like you do with the specific equipment, but Fridays and Mondays are generally when the staff really does the maintenance on it because, you know, Chris and his team are actually going and rethreading everything, making sure there's all the equipment's up and running. So that is part of why it's important that we do close on um, a little bit of downtime. And again, it doesn't have to always be Mondays and Fridays. Um, it's working up, but that's really primarily when they do the regular maintenance. And I think that's why everything's working so well because staff is really um, has that attention to detail for that. I will say probably the most needy equipment has been the sewing machines and the embroidery machines. Just, oh, really? Yeah, it seems like we had some issues with those early on. But good thing. I would just reiterate Jen's uh, comment and mine from a few months ago that, um, you know, while I you know, run a business that needs a lot of attention to details and, and fixing, and we are also closed a couple days a week, so that we can get to those like projects. Um, you know, I always have to look at it is when do people want to be here? And, you know, what is the best use and what is the best way to meet the needs of the customer? And so, you know, I would, I know personally, you know, my kids are off school on Fridays and Mondays. We've got another holiday coming up where it's, the kids are off Thursday, Friday for parent teacher conferences. And then the following Monday, they're off. So again, we have this long weekend. There are people who don't go away um, this time of year, especially if there isn't snow on the ground or it's too cold. It's like, what are you going to do with your kids? I'm sick of, I don't want to go to the movies and just have them sit there. I don't want to put them in front of the screen at home, you know, um, and, and like, yes, we can go bowling. Yes, we can go to an art studio and make something. But at some point, it's like, what I want to do something different, right? I want to learn something new. And I, I do think that it would be beneficial to have at least a Monday or a Friday be open specifically for when the kids are off school. Um, that often tends to be when an adult might also have off 
because they decided to give themselves a long weekend. I don't know a lot of adults that are like, hey, I'm gonna take a Tuesday off to go work in the maker place and check out the equipment. Um, I did go on a Tuesday and Wednesday <laughs> to get the shirts done because that was when I didn't have to do deal with the kids. And I, you know, but um, I don't know, it's something to look at. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thanks, I, I know I said I was gonna stop talking, but I, I think that might be a really good opportunity for programming. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it doesn't need to be, you know, for now, every Monday or Friday, but if there was a day that school is closed, yeah, just having like, hey, kids come in and sew a poncho or, you know. That might also be, yeah, that's actually an excellent uh, suggestion that maybe it isn't open on a Monday or, or a Friday, but I mean, look at the school districts closest to us. When are they off? That maybe there is specific parent-child programming, caregiver child programming, you know, not that it's babysitting, not saying that, that, you know, that there's some sort of learn, learn yeah. about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just that's a great make, make little future makers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I assume this won't be an agenda item, but you will include the um, uh, dashboard in your uh, executive director report, yes. the other dashboard. Yeah. Right. So, okay, great. All right, we're up to other. Any others? Greg. Greg. Oh, Greg, you got another? Yeah, I do real quick. Um, so first of all, we had the, uh, the first strategic planning meeting in, in, in Amy and Sarah, thank you for uh, for being part of that. I don't know if you have any kind of like anything that you want to mention on that. Um, but one thing I will say is we had decided um, we decided that it was Amy and Sarah were going to be the trustees, and then I was going to be part of it also. So they have the three of us towards the meeting. So the day before the meeting, I realized that we can't do that because it's an open meeting and we can't have more than two, we can't have more than trust two trustees and that. So I backed out of it for that one. So what we're gonna do, um, cause when we did this before we actually had a standing committee um, with, it, you know, it was an open meeting and everything uh, for this. So we're gonna do that for the next upcoming meeting uh, that we're gonna have. We're actually gonna make it, make it an open meeting. So we'll have minutes and uh, and all that kind of stuff that goes on. Just how we used to do the standing committees before we went to the uh, to the committee of the whole model. I don't know if anybody has any questions on that or no. It was a great meeting. It was um, some people were here, some people were virtual. It was an hour and a half um, before the meeting. We read comments from the community, and there were pages like 200 pages of comments mm -hmm. mostly great you know some you know just all over the place so we kind of um the group was very dynamic in that like different people in different areas of the library were there um so i think uh we're due to get some notes from sarah uh, our consultant um and focusing on you know what the next steps are we have a doodle poll to have another meeting um, soon. But basically, I I mean, my impression was that the community is very um, pro-enthusiastic about the library. A lot of people don't understand the maker place. And so I think that that's going to be one of the strategic goals that we have. Um, there wasn't a lot... In, in looking, I asked Mike to to um, provide us with previous time that this was done, what the study said, just to kind of get a gauge at like, are we seeing different things, the same things? We didn't see a whole lot about staff, I didn't think, which definitely was in the last go around. Um, I mean, there was some staff stuff, but that didn't seem to be an area that really needed a lot of attention, but just the maker place, I think is gonna be a big part of it. Um, making sure we meet the needs of everyone in the community from little kids to older people, you know, making sure perhaps that we bring the library to others and people were very pro um, bookmobile. And so other programming that we do with other areas in Arlington Heights, like the park district or um, the village or the historical society, I think I have a feeling that some of that might come out. What did you think, Sarah? Anything else? 
I mean, it was it was interesting because there were a lot of different, you know, people um, from different areas of the library too. Okay. Anything else to be brought up? Okay. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? 